live from Central Park in New York City. Did you ever pray for something that didn't materialize? Did you ever beg and plead, God Almighty, give me this, that, and the other, make this happen? And it didn't. How did that make you feel? This is what happened in a very intense way to Moshe Rabbeinu in this week's Torah portion of Eshanan, where Moshe says, he opens up the parsha saying, Va'eschanan el Hashem, or, and I pleaded to God on that day, on that time, requesting. His lifelong mission was to bring the Jewish people into the Holy Land. That's what he pleaded for, that's what he wanted for, that's what he worked for his whole life. And what happened? God said no. And how did God say no? God said, Rav Lach, Moshe, Rav Lach. Rav Lach means, it's too much for you, you're asking too much. And there's about 50 different interpretations. What exactly he meant by that? You're asking too much. And why he used those words. And then, Hashem says, Al Tosef, don't continue to ask me. Don't even ask again. Stop asking. Can you imagine you're begging something from someone you love, from your parents, or from God Almighty, and they say, stop asking. How kind does that sound? That's what happened in the sixth Parsha. And there's a lot to unpack over here. And more questions are, what happens now? Now that Moshe, Moshe prayed, and the Torah tells us that he prayed, the number of prayers that are in the word, the name of the Parsha, and it's 515. He prayed 515 times. Where did all that energy go? Where did all those prayers end up? What happened to that, that powerful, eternal energy from Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest leader of all time? And how about us? What happens with us if we ask questions and God doesn't answer the way we want it to be? Hi. I remember a very cute little sign that I kept on my desktop for many years. It says, God's three answers. Number one is yes. Number two is later. And number three is I have something better in store. Yes, later, I have something better in store. Somewhat similar to this is the idea of the answer, of the response to these questions. These are also obviously big, powerful questions that could take a lifetime of learning. But today we're just going to zoom through some answers very quickly. And also, of course, if Hashem knew that the answer is going to be no, why would He let Moshe pray for so long? Why would He allow him to waste all that energy? So, so some of the answers we're going to try to answer very quickly. I'm just going to say quickly, give a shout out. I came here for up uh, Sharon for my grandson Eliezer of Levin in South Bronx and we're here for Shabbos and also the first part of this Devar Torah of this talk is the answers to these questions and then the second part if you're still here I'm going to add some other eye candy some beautiful related notes that are not essential to these answers but there's two answers that we learned Rabbi Shneir Ashkenazi from Israel uh, spoke this beautifully last week, and this is a summary of that. The simple shot answer from the Malbim is that every person in this world has a mission. The Neshama comes down to achieve something, to be productive in a certain area. Moshe's was obviously a very big one, but Moshe's mission did not include going into Israel and settling the land. That was Yehoshua, Joshua's mission. So the Malbim says, when God says to 
Mr. Moshe, stop. Stop asking. Stop pleading. Stop praying. He wasn't being cruel or mean. But he was telling him, Moshe, this is not your mission. As much as you want it, you have a different mission. And you've already completed your mission. And now it's time for someone else to do what you want to do. Which is something that we all might come upon, chance upon in our lifetime, somewhere, sometime, ourselves included. We were here and I, I ran around this reservoir at least 10,000 times in our 16 year duration in Upper, Side, Upper West Side Manhattan. And it was beautiful and it was good while it lasted. But then we were called to another mission and other people are doing our job here. Our children, Sapos, Baruch Hashem. So I feel that personally, personal relevance to what I'm talking about now, but of course it's not on the great big scale of Moshe Rabbeinu wanting to go into Israel. So, related to that, God said to Moshe, later on at the end of days, all these people, your generation, that perished in the desert, they will all go to Israel with Mashiach. They need you to be there to bring them in. And the Midrash gives a whole beautiful example about that, about why Moshe has to be there. But the bottom line is, Moshe's mission was to stay with his people. A leader never leaves his flock. And that's why he, has to, he had to stay in the desert and not enter Israel. Moving on, there's a different take, a Hasidic take, that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who had his own great ideas, and most often quoted Chabad Rebbe's, but rarely he also quoted other Hasidic leaders. And in this one he did, he quoted the Munkacher Rebbe. The Munkacher Rebbe said that God was telling Moshe, stop asking at 515. Stop now, because if you ask one more time, I will have to concede. I will have to agree. I won't be able to contain myself anymore. Somewhat like a child who begs the parent for something again and again and again. Obviously something that's good and it's okay and acceptable. And the parent, just for whatever reason, is busy and says no, but if you nudge long enough, you get it. So too says the Mokachar that Hashem said to Moshe, stop asking because one more tear will break my heart, figuratively, and I'll have to let you in. And that's not in your best interest, and it's not in the best interest of the world, of the future, of all the future, the Jewish people and the world. So that's what the one culture says. The Rebbe had many chassidim who asked many, many questions. The Rebbe's responses are enlightening to us all in many ways. One rabbi, the grandfather of the Rabbi Ashkenazi who taught this, his name is Rabbi Gurari, and he was a wealthy man and he did great things. And for some reason, he felt that he was promised more than he received from God, from the Rebbe, from the Rebbe's blessings, from God, of course. And he complained said to the Rebbe, he says, this is what I did, this is what I got in return, it doesn't match up, I deserve more. Said the Rebbe to him, God doesn't remain in debt. God repays every prayer. So this is an answer to the question, what happened to Moshe's prayers? What happened to the 515 prayers that Moshe begged and pleaded. What happens to my prayer, to your prayers, that you want something, but you get a different answer? Says the Rebbe, God doesn't remain in debt. In every single prayer that we offer, all the energy that we put in to asking God for something, we get it. It comes back. Shabbat Shalom. It comes back to us. Not necessarily, not necessarily, in the time frame or the way, the mode that we expect or want. 
Sometimes it's today, sometimes it's tomorrow or later. Sometimes it's personally with us, sometimes it's with our children, grandchildren, our future generations, or horizontally, our extended family and friends. The energy that we put into prayers come back to us, we get, we, the, they are responded to and they materialize, but not always the way we expect them. And that goes back to that little sign I had on my computer screen. When God answers, it's one of three things. It's either yes, later, or I have something better in mind. I have something better in mind because God knows what's best for us. And sometimes we figure it out on the way in the journey of life, and sometimes we don't. This is the first part. That's the main thing I think I answered in a very short, a basic idea. Uh, one more related point is that why ask if we're not going to be answered? Why did Hashem let Moshe continue praying? So aside from the fact that he is going to be answered, maybe in a different way, it's also the idea of prayer is connection. Tefillah also means connection to God. When we pray, we intensify our connection. And every time we pray, we intensify our ask to be, to be, which brings us closer to God. So the more we pray, the more, the more intense our prayers are, and the more, the closer we get to God. This is the end of part one. You can hang up here if you need to get ready for Shabbos. If you want to stay for another five minutes or so, I'll share another few eye candy, how I call it. Really beautiful things about related to what we're spoken, what we just spoke about. The Torah says, but Hanan, Hashem and I pleaded with Hashem. Ves Hanan is five is like a numerical value of 515, 515. So all the commentaries say that Moshe pleaded 515 times. The Pnei Yoshua, a Talmudic commentary, commentary, says that it was actually exactly 515 times, and he makes this calculation fascinating. He says that from the day that Moshe started requesting, which was on the 15th day of the month of Av, Hamisha Asar Be'av, after Tisha B'av, which is basically kind of tomorrow, I think it is, Hamisha Asar Be'av, it's right now. The 15th day of Av was a day, the great day for the Jewish people in various ways. One of them, somebody else explains, was because the Midrash says that the Jewish people stopped dying in the desert. And for years, like about 60,000 Jews every year would die in the desert in the 40 years of their death, of their, of their wandering in the desert. And on the 15th day of Av, they stopped. They knew they stopped because they would dig their graves on the 9th of Av, get into it, about 60,000 people, and the next morning they wouldn't get up. Until one year it didn't happen, they didn't die, and they waited another night, another night, until they saw that the moon, the moon was full. That's the 15th day. So they knew that they were free, that the decree of all the people to die in the desert was over. So now, that's a great day. That's the date that Moshe Rabbeinu started praying, according to many commentators. And this is the reason given by a chassid of the Rebbe, Rabbi Shimon something, Shimon Gams or Shammai Gansberg. And he says, because Moshe saw that it was a great day, so he yeah, uh, appropriate day for good things. So he asked, he started asking. Now he started asking on the 15th of Av, and he passed away on the 7th of Adar, Zion Adar. That's when he died. From 15th of Av until Zion Adar, the 7th of Adar. If you minus all the Shabbatot, all the, there's actually 200 days, and from that span of time, if you take off the Shabbat, things like 28 Shabbats or something like that, ends up being 172 days. Because on Shabbat, we don't pray for our requests. We pray, but we don't ask for things on Shabbat. So he asked, assuming this calculation, he asked three times a day, Shachar Smin morning, afternoon, and evening, 
for 172 days. 172 times three is 516. He prayed 515 times because on that date, before the 516th time, God stopped him. It was on the seventh of Adar. And he said, today's your day where you have to pass away and you're not going to ask me even one more time. Because I can't change the rules now. So there's a beautiful calculation about the 515 times. Another thing we said was why he chose. It says that Sanan Atom Ba'etahi on that date. Why did he choose that date? Because it was the day that it was uh, appropriate for, for good things because the people realized that they stopped dying. Moving on, God said to him, Rav Lach. That was his, the words, too much for you. So the Talmud says, the Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu used the same terminology when the Levine, when Korach and his whole group wanted to, wanted to become leaders. And he said to him, Rav Lachem, B'nai Levi, you're asking too much. So God said to Moshe, look, you said Rav Lachem to them, here's a Rav Lach to you. Same thing, it's too much for you, you're asking too much, you're asking for something that doesn't belong to you. That's from the Talmud. Moving on, the uh, Gemara says that we, on Rosh Hashanah, we blow a hundred blasts of the shofar. Why a hundred? The Gemara says because Sisra's mother was standing by the window in biblical times, waiting for him to come back, for her son to come back. And Sisra was an evil enemy of the Jews, and she cried a hundred times. Since she cried a hundred times, we blow a hundred blasts. Toswit asks, who is counting? Who's counting this evil man's mother's cries? And he answers, if someone answers, God Almighty. God listens to the cry, to the pleas, to the requests of everyone, no matter how good or otherwise they are. So too, God listens to all of our prayers, of course, especially for good people. And Rabbi Ashkenazi ended with a story that he personally encountered. There was a family who knew that they couldn't have children for 13 years. They tried all kinds of uh, IVF. And finally, they had a baby. And six years later, the first the baby passed away. Some tragic accident. And of course, they were terrified and horrified and saddened and tragic for this, for, from this tragic incident. And they tried for 13 years before that. And also simultaneously, in the last six years, they weren't able to naturally have children. Long story short, nine months later, or ten months later, they gave birth to a natural baby. So God answered their prayers in a different way. God should answer all our prayers better than we expect, sooner than we expect, and, uh, and revealed good. God bless you all.